the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. So this morning, fifth Sunday of Lent, we celebrate the life of St. Mary of Egypt. St. Mary looms large in Lent. During the first four days of Clean Week, we pray the great canon to St. Andrew, and we read the life of St. Mary. And this past Thursday was the Thursday of the great canon, in which the entire canon and the life of uh, St. Mary were again prayed for in a single service. And again today, we honor the remarkable life of this saint. It's a life of repentance, asceticism, and prayer. She is an example and an encouragement to all. Her life demonstrates the immeasurable love of God, teaching us that no one can fall so far away from him that they are unable to repent and have a relationship with him. Her life story is told by Zosismus. He was a monk who was directed by God to leave the monastery where he lived in most of his life and to go to a monastery by the Jordan River. The name of the monastery is not given. So at this monastery during Lent, it was a habit of the monks to go into the desert for 40 days, each by themselves. And during one of these Lents, uh, St. Zosisma saw a naked figure in the desert. He chased the person to learn their name, only to have Mary stop and call him by name. So this unnerved Zosismas. So he, he wanted to talk with her, but she agreed to talk with him only for her to give her a coat to cover her nakedness. So she turned to him, and after some discussions, they were going back and forth of who's going to bless who, Mary agreed to, to pray for the monk. So Zosismas listened to the prayer with his head bowed, gazing at the ground. While the prayer was getting long, and after having been going on for some time, he looked up and saw that Mary was hovering about 18 inches above the ground um, while she was praying. And again, Zosismus was very shaken. He's like, who is this holy woman? So when the prayer ended, he begged the saint to tell her her story, how she came to be in the desert. And so she tells him he was born in Egypt, but at the age of 12, she left her family and moved to Alexandria. And there she lived the life of a harlot. She said she was consumed with the passion of lust and now from that take payment for her job. Well, one day when she was there, there was a great commotion in the city. People were running towards the sea. So she asked why they were running, and, where, and uh, she was told they were going to Jerusalem to venerate the precious and true life-giving cross. So Mary desired to go with them, but she had no money. So she talked to a group of young men and um, was able to uh, take passage on their boat um, for payment she applied her trade. Well, now, I'm gonna pause here. For these few sentences of her story, you know, they often go a little bit unnoticed. These young men were going to venerate the true cross of our Lord. It should have been a spiritual journey for them, something that would bless them and lift them up in their spiritual life. But instead of a spiritual journey, it ended up in a moral passion. So these young men are a warning for us that you know, we, we may be embark on something good, a good moral journey, a good, a good path that we want to follow. But if we lose our focus and let the earthly passions overcome us, we will lose our blessing. We are never told what happens to these young men. So Mary gets, gets to Jerusalem. And upon getting to Jerusalem, she went to the church uh, to venerate the true cross. However, when she got to the threshold of the church, she was not able to get in. Something kept her back from passing the threshold. People would jostle past her, they were able to go in, but she wasn't able to. So having tried to enter the church for a while, she was being tired from being pushed around by the people, and she stood off to the side. And then she began to realize why she was unable to enter the church. It was because of her sinful life. So she began to weep, and she saw an icon of the Theotokos who prayed of her repentance. And after that prayer, she was able to enter the church and uh, venerate the cross. And so she came out after venerating the cross, and once more prayed before the icon of the Theotokos. She prayed a prayer of thanksgiving for being allowed to venerate the true cross of Christ. And she asked to be led into repentance. She heard a voice saying, if you cross the Jordan, you will find glorious rest. So she left and began her journey to the Jordan River. That night, she received the Holy Mysteries at the Church of St. John the Baptist. And the next morning, she, she crossed the Jordan, and she tells us that she hasn't talked to a person for 47 years. So Zizismus marveled at her edifying story. The saint then tells of the following year, he would not be allowed to spend Lent in the desert, but she wanted uh, him to meet her at the, at the shores of the Jordan on Holy Thursday so she can receive the Holy Mysteries. And she tells him not to tell anybody of the meeting that they had had. And so the following year, during Lent, so Zismus um, actually had a fever, 
and was unable to go into the desert as the other monks did. But on the evening of Holy Thursday, he did bring the sacred gifts to the shores of Jordan and waited for the saint. When he saw her appear, he realized there's no boat. She can't get across the river. She, however, made the sign of the cross and then walked over the water. She received the sacred gifts and asked the monk to meet her in the following Lent season at the first place they had ever met. So the following year, Zosismus travels 20 days to the spot we first saw Mary, and he found her dead body. And she had left a note telling him that her name was Mary. She had never told him that before. And then she had arrived there on the night she received the Holy Mysteries, and she asked her to bury her at that spot. So she traveled in one hour, what took Zosismus 20 days to walk. So he found a piece of wood and tried to bury the saint, but the ground was too hard. So he was straining to dig, he was getting tired, he was getting worried. And then he looks up and he sees a lion licking the saint's feet. At first he was kind of afraid, of course, but he makes a sign of the cross of the lion and asks him to help dig the grave for Mary. So they buried her together. The lion returned to the desert, but says we return to his monastery and he told the story of Mary to all the monks. It was passed down orally until it was written by Saint Sophronius. The Life of Mary was actually written about the same time the Greek canon was composed, and they have been linked together uh, since their inception. For both compositions offer comfort and the hope for those seeking the path of repentance and forgiveness. So that was the story of St. Mary. And today, uh, the, the Gospels for the saint, uh, there's oftentimes the Gospel for the saint, we read it and we're not exactly sure why. This one, it's kind of clear about why this gospel was chosen for Mary. So the passage uh, for, for her was uh, Luke 7, 36 to 50. which is the story of uh, the harlot when she found out that Jesus was in the house of Simon the Pharisee. She came with an alabaster box of perfume. Uh, she was weeping. She was wetting Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair. She kissed his feet and anointed his feet with the perfume. Now, Simon was indignant. Think that if Jesus was truly a prophet, he would know what sort of immoral ruin was touching him. But the Pharisees thought hollers were comparable to lepers. They're, they're unclean, untouchable. But these, Jesus then tells the parable of two people who owed a money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other owed him 50. But the money lender graciously forgave both their debts. And so Jesus asked, which would love him more? And Simon answers, the one who was forgiven more. And Jesus said, yes, you were correct. He then compares to how the woman and Simon treated Jesus. The woman with love, Simon with um, indignity and superiority. He then says the woman who had many sins was forgiven because she loved much. And he tells her that her sins have been forgiven and she can go in peace. The common theme of today's gospel and the life of Mary is repentance. It's repentance that leads to forgiveness. We can wonder if Mary knew this gospel uh, lesson and if it encouraged her in those years in the desert by herself as she lived in asceticism and, and prayer. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. It literally means uh, to perceive afterwards. So the second part of the word is neo. And it's related to the nous, the mind, the seeds of moral reflection. It signifies a change of one's mind, a change of one's purpose. As used in the New Testament, the change is always for the better. In nearly every instance when metanoia is used, the repentance is from sin and evil to good and following Christ. Repentance is also often uh, described as turning, a turning from self and sin to living for the Lord. It implies a complete change of life, a rejection of sin with our whole heart. In a certain respect, the entire Bible is a call for us to repent, to turn to God. In the law, God provided um, a sin offering for those who had sinned. When he would sin, he would offer the proscribed sacrifice, and his relationship to Yahweh would be restored. This was repentance. This was turning toward the Lord to receive his forgiveness. And in the first words of uh, Mark's gospel, Jesus says that time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus' call was turning from the law to the gospel, to himself to his teachings, which are the fulfillment of the law. And his teachings will raise the moral level of law, as if you read the Gospels. The moral, moral level of law is always raised and brought more into the heart instead of being something that's just following. 
So his message was a message of life, a message that was allow us to know God personally. Uh, what does it mean to repent? One of the Desert Fathers, uh, St. Pimen, says, Repentance means to admit and feel remorse for one's sins, to abandon one's sins, and never to return to them. In this way, many sinners became saints, many wicked men became righteous. So it means not only turning from our obvious sins, but also over keeping watch over our thoughts, keeping them pure, not thinking evil of other people, keeping away from sinful pleasures and thoughts, and following the teachings of the gospel. So in a certain sense, the, the path of repentance is not difficult to understand, but it's very difficult to follow. Many of the fathers called repentance a second baptism. Our first baptism cleanses of our sins, but we are weak and we continually fall into sin. But God in his love gave us repentance, in which we can rise from our falls, be healed, and continue to seek to draw near to him. We can approach repentance with faith and zeal and with gratitude, because today's gospel teaches us and the life of Mary teaches us that no matter how far you have fallen away or how deep you are in sin, God's love, God's grace, and God's forgiveness is always greater. We saw that in both women today, although they're married to sin, they both truly repented they are forgiven, washed clean, and given a new life in Christ. The goal of repentance is to restore relationship with the Lord, receiving his forgiveness and drawing nearer to union with him. St. Mary's life looms large in Lent because Lent is the time that the church focuses on repentance and purifying ourselves. So maybe we draw strength through her example and seek union with our Lord, the union that she had with the Lord that she exemplified. So as we need, draw near to the end of Lent, we are shown two wonderful examples of repentance and what repentance brings, forgiveness and unity with our Savior. So may we all complete our Lenten journey, turning from our passions and finding the love and the forgiveness that our Lord and Father seeks to bestow upon each one of us. The blessing of the Lord be upon you, who is the love and grace of mankind, always, now, and ever, unto the ages of ages. Oh,